Scripture reading will be 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 13 through 25, and I'll read from the ESV. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope full, fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passion of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy. You also be holy in your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed uh, from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ. Like that of the lamb without blemish or spots, He who was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who thought, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead, from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God for all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass the grass withers and the flower falls but the word of the Lord remains forever and this word is the good news that was preached to you good morning church family how are y'all doing this morning part of you are doing good other part not so much Well, I have a confession to make. This morning's been a little bit of a frazzled morning myself. Um, You know, somebody asked me how you're doing, and my natural response was, I'm doing just fine. How are you doing? Uh, But the truth of the matter is, is that a little frazzled this morning, the kids got up, and I don't know what's wrong with them. You know, it's crying about this, crying about that, fussing about this, fussing about that, you know. You settle, settle one argument, and then... They start another one, and then you finish that, and then they start another one. And, you know, their mom and dad, and we're just like, blah, 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 blah. what's going on? You know, so this morning we're late getting out of the house, and we're just like, ah, ah, ah. But it is good to be here, uh, and it's great to be here because you're here. You know, uh, and as we gather together, we know that the most important thing that we're gathering together is to remember that Jesus is our Lord, to remember that he has come for us, that he set an example for us, that he loved us so much that he died for us. And that's what we're here to remember. And we're to remind each other of that and to encourage one another of that. But also while we're here, we also want this to be a place where the mask can be taken off. Amen. We want this to be a place where we are a community that is authentic and honest and real because Life is difficult, and it's frustrating, and there's struggles, and there's mornings that you wake up, and the mornings aren't perfect. There's weeks that you go to work, and you've got a co-worker that you just, you know, where they say, you know, you want to have a come-to-Jesus talk with them, and you want to put your hands of love on them. There's times in our lives where we're in this world, and we just, we can't believe what we're hearing, we can't believe what we're saying, And we're frustrated and we're tired. But then there's also moments of great joy and happiness and shared moments of love and peace, right? I mean, life ebbs and it flows. It goes up and it goes down. And we're here to share that together and to encourage one another and to remind one another that life is good in the Lord. Amen? And that even though whatever we're facing and what we're going through, right, we have the hope of an eternal home in heaven with God But not only with God, with one another. Amen? We get to spend eternity with God and we get to spend eternity with one another. We're continuing our study this morning of 1 Peter. And Peter is writing this letter to a group of Christians who, believe it or not, they're not so much different as you. They get up, they go to work, they're trying to make a living, provide for their family, they're trying to find some happiness. They are trying to live out their faith in a difficult circumstances, in a difficult world. They know 
what it's like to be human. And more importantly, Jesus knows what it's like to be human because he came and lived a life in this fleshly body. And the Christians that Peter is writing this letter to have faced difficulties. They faced pushback from the culture. They, they're facing persecution from Nero. They're running scared. They're having, some of them are having their property killed. Some of them are being killed. Their relatives are being killed. They're trying to be faithful. They're trying to follow God. And they're just frustrated and they're scared and they're tired. And Peter's writing this letter saying, Hey, remember the salvation that we have. Remember, it's true. Jesus has come in the flesh, and we are witnesses of that. We are eyewitnesses to his life, to his resurrection, to his teaching, and we're passing that on to you. Don't give up the fight. Don't give up on your faith, but stay encouraged and keep your eyes firmly planted on Jesus and stand firm in the true grace of God. What is the true grace of God? It's that Jesus loves you. And he came and gave his life for you, for you, for me. Don't give up. As we look here in verse 13, Peter says this, Therefore, referring back to this great salvation that we looked at last week that Peter reminded them of. It's this great salvation that the prophets of old earnestly longed to look into. They studied it trying to figure out about Jesus. And even angels, Peter says, are so interested in this great salvation that God has brought to mankind that they're interested in it. And he says, this is a great salvation. Therefore, because of this great salvation that you have, prepare your minds for action. Prepare your mind for actions. Um, Some of your translations may read, uh, gird up the loins of your mind. Does anybody's translation say that? Gird up the loins of your mind? Okay, that's, that's a little bit of an old translation, but the imagery that Peter is using is they had these long robes that, that they would wear uh, in the first century, and they had a belt. And if they wanted to do something vigorous like run, they had to grab up the hems of their garments and then tuck them inside their belt so that they could be prepared to run so that they wouldn't be tripped up by their feet. So Peter is telling the church, get your minds ready for action Prepare your minds to do something about what's going on in your life. Prepare your mind for actions. Uh, One of the things that we have been talking, talking about in our Wednesday night Bible class is about how we as human beings oftentimes make decisions based upon our emotions rather than our intellect. Um, Psychologists, uh, I, I read several years ago that psychologists spend a great deal of their time, right, trying to convince people to go with what they understand is the right and logical thing to do rather than their emotions. We like to think of ourselves as rational beings, but the truth of the matter is, is that most of the time we make decisions based upon our emotions. The good thing about the mind that God has given us is that the mind can override your emotions, but you have to set your mind to it. And Peter is saying, because you have this great salvation, prepare your mind to do something about it. See, we have choices that you have to make. We have to think about what we're doing and why we're doing it and how it's influencing us, right? The habits that we're giving ourselves to day by day is either reinforcing our belief in Christ or our character that we're trying to produce in the likeness of Christ or allow Christ to to produce it in us as we're making decisions that habitually in our lives are leading us toward that, that shaping our hearts, that shaping our minds to be more Christ-like, or we are making choices and decisions to where our minds and our hearts are not being led. We have to put forethought into what we are doing. We have to put forethought into the choices that we are making. Peter says, be sober-minded. Be sober-minded isn't just a catchphrase that we that we should take with us he's saying prepare your mind for actions be sober-minded you have to think about how to stay sober-minded in the first place amen in order to be sober-minded this relates to how you need to prepare your mind for actions you have to think about the situations that you can find yourselves into don't put yourself into a situation in which you're going to be tempted Think about it. Don't just let life live you. You live life on purpose. 
You make the decisions and the choices on how you want to live and what you want to influence your life and then live accordingly to that. Live or prepare your mind for actions being sober minded. You have to set your hope fully on God and on the grace that will be brought at the grace um, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what we are aiming for. As Christians, as a matter of fact, they were talking this morning about uh, kind of being born into the church. How many of you grew up going to church? Your parents grew up going to church. Many of us, right? A lot of us. Well, sometimes when we're thinking about the sin or the conduct in our lives, because that's what Peter turns to is the conduct that's in our lives. If we grow up in the church... Uh, and I didn't, uh, but Rachel did. And so she and I have talked a lot about this, uh, is that she's pretty good, right? She didn't get into a lot of trouble that other people uh, have a tendency to get into. And so sometimes she struggles, not intellectually with the idea of sin or theologically with the idea of sin, but in her conscience, in her emotion, and and what is sin in her life. Because at the end of the day, We all have to be converted, amen? We all have to be converted that Jesus is our Lord. Who did Jesus come to die for? Sinners, right? Sinners, those who have missed the mark, those who have rebelled against God, those who have gone their own way. Jesus died for all of humanity, and Romans tells us that that there's none of us that is without sin, that we've all sinned and fallen short of the honor and the glory, right? Right? But sometimes when we grow up in the church, we, we kind of get this idea, or emotionally at least, that we've kind of arrived almost. Uh, at least we don't verbalize it, but there is a feel and a spirit. Would you agree with that? That there's a spirit and a feel to us about that we've arrived? And sometimes we struggle to understand what sin looks like uh, in our lives as a church. Uh, and so I want to talk about that a little bit this morning because that's what Peter is talking about is, is holy conduct. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. And so what I want us to do is look over in Galatians chapter 5 very quickly. In Galatians chapter 5, this is, this is what, uh, how uh, Paul the Apostle kind of breaks down sin. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19. I'm glad to hear those Bible pages turning. He says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. Right? You look down at the bottom in verse 21, it says drunkenness and orgies. And I think sometimes in the church, you know, we think, well, you know, I'm not participating in orgies. I'm not uh, giving into drunkenness. I'm not giving myself into sexual immorality. You know, I'm not breaking the laws. And so... I'm good to go. I mean, those are the big, easy sins to point out, aren't they? Those are the ones that are easy to point to and say, yeah, hey, I'm not doing that. I'm not participating in that. But look at the other sins that Paul addresses here. Sensuality, look at verse 20. Idolatry. Now, is anybody in here struggling with bowing down before a piece of wood or a piece of metal and offering up sacrifices to it. Anybody in here struggling with that? Not many of us are struggling with that, right? But there are idols in our lives, are there not? There are people or things that we look up to, right? Things that we are trying to conform our lives to. In this world that we live in, there's people in the world that we call idols, right? There's even a show called American Idol. Uh, And I don't want to read too much into that, but I just want to, you know pepper our minds with the thought that these thoughts of something being an idol, something that we're looking up to and something that maybe perhaps we're aspiring to, right? The things that are giving us the direction in our lives, the thing that is, that is pushing us towards what we think about as, as movement or success, at least in a worldly sense. Money can be an idol, right? Success can be an idol, Praise and admiration from other people. That can be an idol if that's the thing that is motivating you and motivating your actions. Uh, Another thing here that he says is sorcery. 
Now, I don't think that many of us are practicing sorcery. I, don't, I hope not. But I have seen several interviews where there are actors and entertainers and people of such that say before they perform, and you know, you can look online and see this, they actually claim that before the performance, I pray to the spirits of the world or the spirits to enter me. I mean, they're actually saying that. That's a form of sorcery. They're praying for spirits to enter them, to give them this power or to lead them or to guide them, right? That's sorcery that is being practiced in our world. I don't know that many Christians are practicing praying for just some empty spirit to enter them. But if people are watching these idols and they're wanting to to mimic them and to make their lives after them, don't be praying for just some spirit to enter you because you could be praying for a demon to enter your life. If it's not from God, if it's not the Holy Spirit, you need not be praying for it to enter your life and to give you power. Only the power comes from God and from His Spirit. Amen? That's, that's the Spirit that we need to be praying enters us. And there are people in this world that pray for those types of spirits to enter them. Now look at this one here. Enmity. What is enmity? You know what enmity is? Enmity means that you have a general hostility towards somebody. We don't, we don't have that problem in the church, do we? Do we? But Paul is serious about this. He's saying, look, look, look there at verse 21 down at the end of it. He says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will do what? They will not er- inherit the kingdom of heaven. Enmity is something that God is calling us against. If we've got a general hostility toward a brother or sister in Christ, then there's something that's going on inside our heart that we need to be aware of. Amen? That's a sin that we in the church can so easily participate in. And Paul says that's something that we need to be aware of because that's not from God. God doesn't want us to be have to have a, a general feeling of hostility toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Because we're a family and we're a community and we need to be unified. And if we have this general sense of hostility in our hearts, right, that's something that, that, that we need to check on. That's something that we need to get rid of. And look at this. He says strife. What is strife? Strife is having this this competition with your brother or your sister in Christ. That you're constantly struggling with them. Doesn't matter what they do, right? Have we seen this? Like it doesn't matter what the person says or does that there's somebody that's there that's just... Just gotta grind the corn, right? They just they just gotta they just gotta rub it, you know. If it's a nerve, they just think I just gotta play with it, you know, just to just to get a reaction. We've not seen that in the church, have we? Right? Yes, we have. We have seen that in the church. Jealousy. There's never any jealousy, is there? Somebody got appointed of this project instead of me, or somebody's getting the praise of, for doing this rather than me, or. We're not ever jealous of one another in the church, are we, because of a position or because of somebody's been appointed to something. That's silly. That's silly because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to come together and not be jealous of one another, but be happy that someone else has been appointed in the church to do something. Amen? Fits of anger. I've seen a couple of those. I've heard a couple of those. Yes? A couple of you are looking down, not looking up. Hope he's not talking about me. We do have fits of anger. You know, if we think about like Cain and Abel, why did Cain kill Abel? Because he was jealous, right? He was jealous that that Abel was being praised and they were both bringing their sacrifices, but he was just jealous. And then fits of anger, right, do what? Lead us to kill somebody or... I don't think that you're raising up and killing somebody. I'm sure it's happened in a church somewhere. Praise God it's not happened here. Amen? Amen? There wasn't enough amens on that one. All right? It's good that we're not killing each other. But, do we ever commit character assassination? Huh? Character assassination. Christians can be pretty good about doing that. You know, well, you know, he's got a bad character. She's got a bad character, you know. Oh, sister so-and-so. Oh, brother so-and-so. Right? And they just start spreading around. What's that do to unity? 
What does all these things do to unity within the body of Christ? It destroys it, right? It divides it. It divides us. It keeps us from being close. It keeps us from being transparent. It keeps us from being authentic. It keeps us from, more importantly, being what? Transformed into the beloved image of God. That's what it keeps us from, is being transformed into His image. And he says that rivalries and dissensions and divisions and envy. These are the things that that we as a Christian body, right, as Christians, need to protect ourselves against. It's so easy for these kinds of things to seep their way into our lives and into our hearts and into our community. And what it does is it achieves the goal of Satan. It divides us. It tears us apart. And we feel like we don't belong here. We feel like we don't fit in. We feel like we have to put on a mask and be perfect. But this is a place where we, where we need to be able to come together and be honest and, and say to each other, you know what? I am struggling with this. I am struggling with that. It's been a hard week. You know, um, we need to be a place where these kinds of imperfections are accepted not in the sense that we're going to just go with it and participate in it, but acceptance in, I understand what you're talking about. I'm going to support you. I'm going to encourage you. Let's, let's work on getting this uh, straight in our lives so that we're following Jesus. Amen? It's a place where we're not hiding sin, but it's a place where we're exposing sin because what happens to sin when it's exposed to the light? It disappears. Darkness loves to stay in darkness, but when we put a light on it, especially the light of love, the love of Christ and the love of His people, it can change our hearts and our lives. Let's turn back over to 1 Peter. We turn back over to 1 Peter. Peter says that it is the Father's imperishable word in verse 18. He says, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways you inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. It's the word of God that calls us into a changing of our lives. It's the word of God that makes us wise to what he is saving us from of the futile ways of our passions that we once lived in. And all of us have once lived in passions that we're not creating a character that is Christ-like within us, right? Our passions and our desires and our futile ways in which we're trying to please ourselves, guess what it does? It never pleases us. And it's the Word of God, as Peter says here, it's the Word of God that makes us wise to the things that are tearing down our hearts and our minds. You know, there used to be this uh, show on, I don't even know what it's called, Uh, it's like VH1 or something like that, or VHS, no, that's a tape. It was a show on one of those shows. (laughs) But it had this... It, it, it would take these actors and it would take these musicians and they would talk about their lives. They would talk about their success and how they, how they came to success. And then they would talk about all the money that they had and all the parties that they had and all the revelry and debauchery that, that, that any, any human being could ever want. And then they would say, but at night when I'm alone and it's quiet, it's hard to sleep. Because I feel alone, because I feel empty, because I feel discouraged. And they would be depressed. And you think, you've got all this money, you've got all this fame, you've got all this success, you've got everything that the world tells you to go after, and you'll be happy. And here they are, from the mouths of musicians, right? And actors and people that's made it, and they've they've lived it, they've got it. They're not happy. They're not happy. You know, so when you see it on TV, you see it in the movies, don't believe the lies. Some of them may be happy, but the vast majority of them are not happy if they're living in debauchery. Debauchery will never make you happy. They pictureize it, uh, they, they show it as glamorous and as something that's going to fill you, but it doesn't fill you. 
I've been at the bedside of many people who have passed. Lots of people. And you know what they have regrets about? It's not about their car. It's not about having this house or that house. It's not about their bank account. But you know the regrets that people have on their deathbed? And I've been by a lot of deathbeds. It's relationships. It's how they treated somebody. It's how they should have forgave this son or this daughter or how they wasted so many years of living life in the fast lane or living life loosely, living in debauchery. They all have regrets about it. And I've been at a lot of deathbeds. Those things are false promises and they're lies. But the Word of God tells us from the very beginning that those things will not fill you. They will leave you empty and they will leave you alone and they will leave you frightened. Believe it. From the very beginning, God has told us the truth. And we may be thinking, as Peter addresses here in verse 17, we may be thinking, well, I've got the salvation of God, I've got the grace of God, I've got the mercy of God, that a little bit of revelry, a little bit of debauchery in my life is not going to hurt me, right? A little bit of passion that I can put my fingers into and have a little fun is not going to make that much of a difference in my life. But Peter reminds them here in verse 17, And if you call on Him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout your time of exile. If you call Him Father... Remember, He judges impartially. He judges impartially. Even though He's your Father, He is not giving a sliding scale for people. Right? If you are a man or a woman, He's going to judge you the same way. If you are a leader in the church, or you're a member of the church, He is going to judge you the same way. There's not a sliding scale. So, you know, when we want to try and do this, well, at least I don't do that. And at least I don't do that. And I'm really not doing that over there. It says God judges impartially. It means He's fair. He's just. He's going to judge you according to your deeds. He's waking up our minds through His Word and saying, this is the way that's going to lead to peace in your life. It's not the same as the kind of peace that the world gives you. Because the world will say, peace, peace on every side, and there's no peace. Because what do they have in between the relationships? Strive, jealousy, enmity, dissensions, rivalries. These are the things that keep people at each other's throats. And then there's no peace in the family. There's no peace in relationships. There's no trust in relationships. You're worried about whether someone's going to betray you or not. You're worried about whether someone's going to let the cat out of the bag. That's why we like to wear our our mask. Because we're afraid and we don't trust. But here in this body should be a place where we can trust. And we're not going to be judging one another based upon our mistakes, but we're going to encourage one another to continue on in the faith of Christ. That we're going to throw off every weight and sin that so easily entangles us, and we're going to run the race that's set before us. Peter tells us, God will judge you impartially. His word doesn't change, and it hasn't changed from the beginning. If you look in verse 24 and 25, it's not like the grass that grows today and is gone tomorrow. God's Word stands forever, and it hasn't changed, and it's not going to change. What God has been producing in us and trying to produce in us is always His holiness. If we look here at what Peter says in verse 15... He says, but as he who has called you is holy, you also must be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. This has been from the very beginning that God has desired holy conduct within humanity. You can go to the next slide. Jesus says, you need to be like me. God says, you need to be like me. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, He said, let us make man in our image. And let us give him the dominion over the birds and over the fish and over the creeping things of the ground. And it says that He created them, both male and female, He created them. 
man and women were created in the image of God from the very beginning to reflect the glory of God. That's why He created us. And in Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 44, He calls the children of Israel to the same thing that Peter quotes here. Be holy as I am holy. God is the standard for what is right. We talked about this on Wednesday night. What makes right, right, and wrong, wrong? If something is right, it's because it's from God. If it's wrong, it's because it's not from God. God didn't just reach up into the sky and pull out or discover these truths or these moral principles and say, Hey, I'm going to make man so that he can follow these principles. These principles that God has called us to, this morality that He has called us to, flows from His very nature, flows from His very character. And what He is trying to produce in us is people who willingly, freely choose to be like Him. He didn't make robots. He made us free will agents. We get to choose and make decisions for ourselves. In the beginning, He made us in His image and said... This is good. God made you in His image and you are inherently good. But it's your decisions and your choices to rebel against Him and to do things your own way. And we've all done it. Because what is sin? Sin is rebelling against God and it's breaking down the relationship between me and God. And then breaking down the relationship between me and my fellow man by the way that I mistreat Him the way that I abuse Him, the way that I am not Christ-like to Him. He has constantly called us to be conformed to His image. And in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, it says, For who He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed into the image of His beloved Son. It's through the preaching of the gospel, the word of the gospel, that Peter talks about them obeying. He says, this is what was preached to you. It is that word, the gospel message of God created you, you sinned, Jesus has come and died for you, and you can have your sins forgiven because He was resurrected out of the tomb to prove that He has the power to give you what was taken from you. Life. Jesus has come to give us life and to give it abundantly in Christ Jesus. We were predestined by the gospel to be conformed into the image of the beloved Son of God. That's what He's called us to. And that's what Peter reminds them of. The church needs to have holy conduct. But this holy conduct... You want to change the slide, please? This holy conduct leads us then to living a loving way. Because that love is to be manifested where? Here in the church, Ephesians chapter 3, 20 and 21. He says, Now to him who is able to do far more exceedingly than you ask or imagined, right? He has granted that we should glorify him in where? The church. God expects to receive his glory in the church. And he receives his glory in the church by how we love one another. John chapter 13 and verse 35. The world will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. God expects to receive glory in the church through the way that we love one another. And that love flows through being like Him and participating in His holiness. Look at what He says here in verse 22 in 1 Peter in chapter 1. He says, Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth... For what? A sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. This is the truth, the abiding word of God, the good news of the gospel that you have believed. He says you obeyed it and you saved your souls through obeying it. But he says there's something that comes with that. A sincere brotherly love. What does it mean to be sincere? It means to be genuine, doesn't it? It means that there's no ulterior motive. I'm not just loving on you because I get something out of it. I'm loving on you because you're created in the image of God. 
I'm loving on you because you're the child of God. I'm loving on you because you're the family of God. I'm loving on you because that's what God has called me to do. This is, this is the transformation that I have agreed to participate in. I have recognized that the world leads to corruption within relationships. That the way that they do things, all it does is destroys relationships. It doesn't build up relationships. I recognize that there's something wrong in this world. Do you recognize it? Do you recognize the sin and, and the hurt and the pain that's in this world? I recognize that there is something wrong in this world. All humanity, I believe, recognizes this. What's wrong with it? It's that we don't have a sincere brotherly love for our fellow man. The person that's standing in front of us that God has created in his image. A genuine love. A love that doesn't have ulterior motives. Look at what he says. He takes it a step further to emphasize it. This is an emphasis because he says it twice in two different ways. In verse 22. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. What does it mean to be earnest? It means to be tenacious. It means to be uh, committed to. It, it, it means to be there and to put effort toward it. To, to keep striving after it. To keep moving towards it. To give effort to loving one another with what? A pure love. A love that is from above. And I think we're all afraid of it on some levels. We're afraid of experiencing that kind of pure love. And that's why we put masks on. Because we think if we put these masks on and I present this best version of myself to you, that you'll really love me and that you'll really care for me. If you just, you know, I want you to fall in love with this mask. But real love, real love that God tells us is a love of honesty. It's a love that is genuine. It's a love that's sincere, right? It's a love that there's no reason for us to have a rivalry. We don't need to be in competition with one another. If you do well, I'm going to be happy for you because you're my brother and sister in Christ. If you're doing poorly, I'm not going to judge you, but I want to encourage you, right? The love that God is calling us to and has created us for is about us making the decision To live the way that he's called us to. That's why Peter says, prepare your mind for action. You're going to have to override your emotions and get your emotions in line with the heart of God. Because God will change you. Not to be be like some success story out there in the world. But he's calling us to this so that you can be like Jesus. And isn't that wonderful? Jesus is the most wonderful person I know. How about you? The reason that I'm a Christian and the reason that I believe in God is because of Jesus. How about you? Jesus is so wonderful and he's so kind and so loving and he's so honest with me. And he calls me to honesty. And what he is calling us to is that transformation. And part of that transformation is a call to us to be a holy family here. Amen? To live it out here in life. We are called to be a holy family. And this morning, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what's happening. I don't know where you're at spiritually. I don't know where you're at mentally. I don't know the doubts you're having. I don't know the joys that you're having. Right? I don't know the excitement that you're having in your life. But we as a family are here to support one another. We don't know how to support you if you remain quiet. Now, you don't have to come and, and shout out before everybody everything, that you're, everything that's going on in your life, okay? But there are elders that are here. There are shepherds that are here. They're in the back of the aisles. You can go to them and talk to them quietly and privately. I'm sure they'll, they'll go into a room with you and you can discuss it. I'm here. I'd be more than happy to discuss it with you. And you've got your brothers and your sisters here. Don't stay by yourself and stay alone. If you're discouraged, if you need help, if you need encouragement, let somebody know. That's why we're here, amen? That's why we're here is to support one another as a family.